Hi there, welcome to Go on the Run Survey Sent Event Part 2. So what are we going to be doing in this video? Well, there are a couple of questions that we should clear up from what we looked at last week. And then there's something that I want to show you in terms of how to deal with multiple clients. Now, it's not the only way probably out there, but I'm going to show you a way and then you can go from there. You can experiment for sure. So let's jump into the code. As you can see, I'm sitting here in my going to run directory and to continue working with the code we had from last week, I'm going to just make a copy of our previous code directory. What are some of the things that we should look at? Well, we have a few of them, so let's get started. So first thing first, let me start running our code that we have. And I'm going to connect to it from a few browsers. So I have my browser sort of ready and going. And so I just have to refresh to tell it to reconnect. But we don't really have a clear way to keep track of client. We just have this connection being made and then they're refreshed and they, of course, get some updated random value. So one of the first thing I want to do before I address this, however, I just want to start back from where we left off, is to clarify some information about how service sent event works. Now, I read the documentation, but I didn't read it too closely. And so a subscriber actually asked me some question on the side, and a subscriber posted some question that forced me to go back and reread things. So one of his first question was, why is it that the client is actually pulling the back end? Can I send data whenever I want? Now remember, once you say that uh, your return in your return header that the type of data you send it is text for slash stream, event stream, the browser keeps a connection open to the server to get more data from the server. Now here's where the confusion comes in, is in what you're seeing happening here it looks like the client is requesting more and more data. And each time it makes a request to that same handler, well, the same handler gets called. Well, it's not too confusing if you go back and you take a look and read the details about how server sent event works. And so I'll spare you the detail, but I'll take you to a part that really explains it. And so if you look at this, it says that each event source object has the following associated with it. The URL, of course, which you specify. And this part. And this is where the, what you're seeing happening here, this re request, is actually a connection in milliseconds. And this must I, ideally, must initially be a user agent defined value. The user agent in this case is our web browser. And they're saying it probably should be in a few seconds. Here we see it look like a second. It depends from browser to browser. After a bit of research, it looks like the different browser um, use different values. So um, if you look at the source code from Overstack, there's a link that points to the source code for, for Chrome and Safari, and it tells you what are different values they use for the reconnect. So that why it looked like a poll is because the standard define that the event object should do a reconnect every few milliseconds. Now, like I said last week, if the frequency of these polls matches your application, how often you want to update your UI, no big deal, right? If, on the other hand, it's not fast enough, for example, you have more you know, frequent data, maybe a game or something that you're doing and you need to send data more frequently. Well, then, of course, what you're going to do is not return from that handler. In Go, once a request handler is called, the only time the request is considered complete is once you return. But remember, you can do flush. All right, so I didn't show you flush the last time. And I'm not really going to show you this. I'm going to tell you about it, but we're not really going to use that as an example because I don't really have a way to show data coming back with sub-second. That, that wouldn't make, I really don't have a game or anything to show you how that would really work. So let me take a look at the code. And so let's say this is your code here. And oh, before I go to the code, maybe what I should do is go to the Golang code and show you the flusher. So let's do Golang and then we want to do packages. So here you have, so you have the flusher interface that allows you to call flush. And if you do some reading about the Flusher interface, it tells you also that the response writer implements a Flusher interface. So there we go, right? The Flusher interface is implemented by the response writer. And so this means that if you want to flush, as the specification says that you can do flush data, what you can do is explicitly so ignore the rest of the code for now 
and just imagine that after writing some data, I wanted to flush it. What I can do is create a flusher. And so there you go. What I do is I did a typecast. So I did take a response writer object and see if you can typecast it. Basically, does it implement the HTTP flusher interface? If it does, then I'll have a flusher object here as F and OK will be true to tell me that, hey, this is all good. This cast worked. If not, then OK will be false and I wouldn't come into this for loop. So if I can flush, then flush. All right. So that's how you would implement a flusher interface. Oh, you sorry. Oh, you'd force a flush and then that would send one set of data and then now you can uh, possibly send some more data. From the specification, the reason why you have to do these two new lines is because you have to separate each event. So if we go back here and scroll down, Here you can see the different types of events you could send. So I told you about a comment stream, basically. It's colon, some data, it means nothing. Your on message function wouldn't get called. But here's your first event, data, first event. And you can tag it with an ID, which we didn't talk about, but you should definitely read this um, document and get to understand how you can use this. It's really, really cool. And then here's a second event. And so notice the space between them. So the new line here, the first new line, act to end the data, but then you need another new line, a blank to say that, oh, oh, that's the first event. So events are separated by a blank line. And so that's why you need the two new line in the code here. And that's why one of them doesn't work. So essentially, um, I can say I want to send an event one and event two. So this can be And so you can see that even though these occur on two lines, this is still considered one event. And so what the user would ex would receive, what you would get on the client side is that is one event. Okay, so only when both of these are received with a blank line, only after a blank line, then the client would actually on message method would get or function would get called to handle that event. So if you have multiple things you want to send within the same call, just separate it out. Maybe you have this in a queue or something, just pull something out of a queue, send it as one event, then pull something and before you return, get something else, send it. And so this is where you leave the connection open and this is where the idea of sending multiple events to the client because once you finish sending this one before you've completed sending this, the client would get it and can process it. So that's the idea of multiple event. And if you can do this fast enough before the reconnect happens, well, there you go. You can send multiple e events or messages in one request. Okay, so I don't want to make this video too long, so I hopefully you get the idea. Hopefully you go read the details here and you can, it, it really explain it very well. So uh, with some good examples. So, oh, so there's the example I was looking for. I went by it. So there's the first message and this is the second message. Okay, and then they tell you how you can use like different, say, event type. So you can tag each event of a specific type, and then you can add listeners to listen on those specific type of events. When you create a new event object, you can pass a second parameter, but that does not allow you to control how often the reconnect occurs. That is not exposed. That's some default that's inside of the browsers. They chose not to expose it. It would be nice if they did, but that second object just basically said whether or not the endpoint is authenticated or not. So um, it allows you to do authenticated connections. But other than that, no way to control how often this reconnect. You're just at the mercy of the browsers. All right. So let's move on. Um, definitely post questions if you have it about this still or anything I'm going to show you today. So one of the things I want to do is make our code a little, look a little bit nice. And if you go to chartjs.org, they have examples of a bunch of charts that you can do with this very simple to use JavaScript library called chartjs. And if you click on get it started, it gives you an example here for a type of chart, a bar chart. But I don't want to do a bar chart. I experimented with a bar chart and I didn't really like it for what we're doing. And so if I go to getting started instead, they have an example for a line chart. And basically this is all there is. You put a canvas um, in your HTML and then in JavaScript and in HTML you import this library 
And in H in JavaScript, you say, well, look up that element, that's the chart element. And in that element, I want to create a new chart. And then you pass it this JSON object that tells it, well, if it what type of chart you're building, and then of course the data for it. So let's do this. So I'm going to copy this verbatim, go back to our code. And of course we're working on the client side. So HTML, I'm going to drop a chart in it somewhere. So where should I put the chart? Well, uh, let's put it just below these guys. So we'll put the chart there. And we have this main JS um, already, but let's import the chart JS library. So I'm going to import that first because in my script, I want to use this library. So I should import it first before my code get called. And now we have to copy this. And let's go to main JS, for example. And uh, let's put this in a function called, I don't know, create chart or something. And so that's fine. And one of the things I want to do is call unloaded, call my create line um, on my loaded function here. So uh, let's do So once I'm loaded, I'm going to make a connection to get some data. And of course, I'm going to call this function to create a, li a line. So let's refresh and see if this worked. So we don't have to stop our go line application. We only have to hit refresh and that should reload the HTML. Oh, and there you go. Very easy, nice and simple. Well, ideally, since we have this value, these values coming back from our backend, we can take that to use that to create our chart. So here is our line data, and these are the value that makes up the line, and we can see there, these are the data points. Um, right now, we only send back about three, three values to represent, you know, books and so on. So I'll like to change this to say, and make this empty at first so we don't have any data points. But what I'd like is each time we get some data, we call this line, create line with the new data to update it. Well, I don't actually want to create a chart each time though. All I really want to do is to update the values. And so and I don't really know if I need to call create charge each time, but we could try it either way. The example I use is I did not call create, but let's try it that way. Instead, so I'm going to pass the create chart, the data that we want to use, and we'll put that here as data. Now, if this works, then I should be able to pass an array of like that. And if I go back and refresh, that works. Okay, so we see books, bicycles, RC car, and so on. There's my data. Okay, great. So that works. Okay, so the only thing I really need to pass then is these values. Let's get some room. So I want to pass the quantities. And so remember, this is a live dashboard. We're supposed to be seeing how many bikes we have in store, how many books we have in store. It basically gives us an idea of what we have in our inventory. So I'll create a variable to store that information. Okay, so that looks okay. Uh, we can decide if we still want to update these, remove them from our documents or not. Um, we can we can make that decision later, but let's see how this works. So now I have those values. Now I just substitute them here. The first one was books. So books quantity, and the next was bicycle quantity. And the last, in this case, was RC quantity, cars quantity. And let's go refresh and see. What happened? Well, for one thing, we call these when the values for these were probably zero. And so we should probably put this inside. So it's called each time our on message function. 
So we should call create line and let's see now if this works. So we're creating a line over and over on the same object and there we go and it's changing. So that's pretty cool. We have a nice visual representation. Not to say this wasn't visual, but now we have charts, which is what we said we can use gauges, lines, whatever. So now you have one way to make your website look a little bit pretty. And so what I want to show you now is how do we keep track of multiple clients? How do we, let's say, for example, you had one set of data that's meant for one client or a user, for example. And so we can think of a client as a user, a different user who's authenticated. We know that the user is coming in at this port or from this website or URL. And so we want to keep track of that so we can give them different set of information than we give other users. But before that, I want to give you some, a few more tips. So, okay, so our front end looks okay. But ideally, if you're going to write a web application, you want to start separating out things. So maybe we may start writing too much JavaScript. So it makes make sense for us to have a directory for JavaScript. And now we want to move the JavaScript files in that directory. And of course, if we do that, we must also update our client side code, so JavaScript. So that should work. Um, the other thing we want, might want to do is also create a directory for our CSS. Just organization. And so we go up to the top here and we say CSS. And it's up to you if you want to create um, directories. Your index.html should sit here. But if you have other sub templates and sub H other HTML that goes along with this, which we're going to get to eventually, we're going to have a directory for different views or whatever, right? So just a little tip on organization. All right. So our code should still be working fine. So let's refresh and make sure that's still the case. And that refresh is fine and appears to be working. So no problem. All right. Now let's go work on our Go. All right. So this is invalid right now because I was fooling around with it talking about events. And let's leave the push, the flush in there for now. Uh, it doesn't hurt, so that's fine. Okay. So one of the things, if you just sort of look, focus on the handler. So let me close this. If we just focus on the dashboard handler, remember that's all we have is this FCC endpoint that gets requests from clients and we return and we say we're doing a text event stream. And by the time we get to the end of this, go consider this request complete. So that's closed. It just so happened that our client is reconnecting and so it looked like a poll to us. Okay. What we want to be able to do is each time we have a client that reconnects, we might want to keep track, like I say, for different users. So how will we know which user is connecting? So all I'm doing is logging the remote address for each connection. So let's stop this. Control C, remember those are gonna try and reconnect. So I don't have to go refresh them. They, they, they have this reconnect because the last thing we said was we're doing server sent event. And because of that, they're gonna reconnect after that re timeout, which is a few milliseconds or seconds in each part of an hour. And notice we have clients coming in at different port. And we can see the numbers being reused, right? See that? So we can use this information and this is the host name, but because I'm doing local connection, it's using that IP version 6 IP address. But if I had, um, I was coming from somewhere else, it would be the appropriate host name. So now if we use just this remote address as a key, we can now use a map to look up clients that have previously been connected and then retrieve some information about that client and make a decision on what they should get. So how might you do that? Well, now we know how to look up clients, but how do we store the information? I sort of hinted at it. I said, we're going to have a map where we're going to look up clients. So you can imagine we're doing something like this. Where clients represent some map of string to some object that we're going to store in clients. And now we can use it. We can say if client is nil, then we didn't find a client. This is the first time they connected. Then we should put them in the map. And then of course, if they've already been in the map, well, then we'll figure out what to do. So 
So here, we're saying if the client wasn't found when we looked them up in the map, that means it's a new client, like I said, so we should add them to the map. And I'm going to use a function for that for uh, just because I want to simplify the code that we write within inside of this if statement. Okay, so first, we need this variable for keeping tracks of our client, and then we need this function. So let's do that. So far, I have the variable and this object. So I'm saying a map string, which is going to be the connection remote string, remote address string to a client object. Well, we should probably deal with pointers just to stop go from doing helping out with our copy in because we want this to be a performant application. In our example, we don't have thousands of users, but we will start thinking that way. And so this is pointed to a client, which I haven't defined yet. And like I said, a client is going to have some information that allows it to do tracking of that client. So one of the things we should probably do, even though we have the map to look up a client, maybe once we have a client object, we will be passing it around. So we should definitely know which client it is. So maybe we want to store that remote ID. So I know the client, but I also want to know what information I need to send to this client. So it seems to me the thing I want is some container. So you can use a map, you can use an array, or you can use a channel is one way to go to say, okay, I can buffer up some events for this channel, for this client, sorry. Uh, I can buffer up some events for this client. And then when I have a connection from that client to say, hey, do you have any data for me? Or when they reconnect, you can imagine the client went to sleep as a mobile device, went to sleep, as soon as the person opened back up the phone, it makes that connection to the back end. It do that reconnect. And now you can send them all the data you have queued up for them, maybe the status or updates or whatever. So again, you can use anything, but in this example, I'm going to use a channel. A channel because it makes it easy for me to think of just inserting data into the channel. And once I read it out, then I don't have to worry about managing what's in the channel. So what I'm doing is we noticed that we're sending a dashboard event to the front end. So I might as well just have my events for the channel be a, a dashboard, a pointer to a dashboard event also. So pretty straightforward. That encapsulates everything we already have that we're going to send into the client. Since I'm not going to be encoding the client and client object in JSON, I don't need to add any field tags. So we're back in our dashboard handler. And so we can assume that again, let's review, look up a client. If it's the, if this client exists, nothing to do here, just move on and send them their events. If they don't exist, add them to the client's map. So we need that function. So this will return an empty client, but we know we need to initialize it with a few things. One of the things we want to do is also initialize this object with the name for the client who's connected and also put it in the map. Okay, so that takes care of that. Of course, we know that we have an event, which is a channel, and by default, channels are nil. We wouldn't be able to add anything to the nil channel. And if we try to read from it, it will be blocked. So let's create a channel. And we can decide to buffer, to make a buffer channel, so that as we try to add things, we can queue up some things. And of course, you will have to know from your requirements and some testing how big this should be, or if you even want to do buffering, the number of ways to implement this. And again, caution, I'm just showing you one way that I spend five minutes thinking about, you will definitely want to spend more time thinking about this. And if you're doing this for a team, discuss it, your ideas with your team. Okay, so that looks like we got that going. Let's see, I thought our events was off channel. Yes. Oh. It would help if I typed the correct thing. Okay, there we go. All right, so now our error went away. And so this looked fine in terms of adding a client to our, a new client. Now, what do we want to do? Now, remember what I said, the first time a client connect, when we respond, we want to send them this er event error to say, hey, there, there are more data that I might want to send you as a stream. 
So keep this connection open. And of course, reconnect too, because remember, that's built into the standard that you should reconnect also after a few time, um, seconds or milliseconds, depending on the client. So this is fine um, to send this back. In terms of sending data, however, if you look at this part, we need to figure out, not from the dashboard, how is this being used? But if our main here, we create this dashboard channel and we have update dashboard that puts event into dashboard and we just pick up an event from there and send it to a client when it connect. But what we want to do instead is get events, not from a dashboard, but rather from clients that events. That's what we want to get um, our messages to send them. Okay, makes sense? Now, there's some other things that you might want to consider. What if you come into this function and you try to get some event for a client and the, there are no events to that client? You would normally, your handler would be blocked. So you don't want to do something like this. So what you should do is try to read the event. And then if you can't get an event, then send a no event, right? So essentially, you're going to do a select on this event. So. And so we'll try to read an event for this client and try to and send it if we can get it. But if there are no events, because we don't know, maybe there are no new events for this client, we still want this function to complete and not be blocked. So, because remember, another reconnect is going to happen. So we should not leave this in, uh, we'll end up using up too much resources and our program will crash. So we want to do a timeout though. How long should we wait? Again, this is something you should discuss with your team, but let's create a timeout. And time that after returns a channel um, on which it sends a time after a certain time you specify. So if we wait on either an event to come out of the client events or a timeout, whichever occurs first, that is what's going to determine how we handle this, but at least we wouldn't be blocked. So for this example, I'm going to put one second. Again, you might have other needs. So you might say, if I don't have, a f if within a few milliseconds, if a client connect and I'm trying to send multiple events, maybe I'm doing this in a loop. If I don't have another event, if you're writing a game to send within a couple of milliseconds, five milliseconds, 10 milliseconds, whatever, then maybe then I want to return nothing, but um, definitely you this is going to change depending on your application needs. So we need another case here. And again, if we get an event for the client, send it. If you don't get an event, send a basically an event that just says there's nothing. And we know how to do this because, um, well, actually, this is the one I want to copy. This means send nothing. And the client essentially just throw that away. I use my two new lines because the first one just goes to the second part of the same message. And the last new line means put a blank between this message and the next message. And it means this is a message. That's how I separate my messages and there's nothing to send. So timeout, don't send anything or just send a comment essentially. And then this should work. Okay. So I think that is not all we need. We, we need a few more things, but this should work right now. We don't, if we do this, we will never have any event to send. We are always going to hit our timeout. And the reason for that is because we don't have anything. We didn't modify our update inventory function is working here. It's adding event to the dashboard and it's populating the dashboard, but we're not reading from the dashboard anymore. We need our dashboard update dashboard function to put event for the clients. So let's do this. We no longer need this. Update dashboard shouldn't be sent into the dashboard because we don't need that anymore at all. So, so let's get rid of this. Where should our event go? Well, after we've done creating some fake event for the dashboard, we need to decide which client should get it. Instead of going wrong ribbon, what I'll do is I'll just select a client and append the event to its dashboard. So I'm going to use this function called get client to just give me a client from our set of clients that we have in our map. And once I have a client,
Now, the reason why I need to deal with nil is because once we kick off our program, update dashboard is going to be running, even if we, we don't make a client connection. And so in that case, we, we're not going to have any clients, so we need to take care of the case when we don't have any clients yet. So let's write this get client. Now, I said I don't want to go through in any particular order, so I'm just going to figure out how many clients I have, grab one of them, and then return that. You can iterate over a map, but other than that, you can't really just grab a random entry in that map. So instead, what I'll do is I'll have another data structure, which is a list, and I will put each connect client remote URL in that list. And because it's an array, I can figure out the length, I can do random number and get one element out of that array, which would be the string. And now I can use that to index into the map. Does that make sense? So let's imagine we had another variable for the list of all our clients. And now this, the only reason we need a map is because we want to quickly find, once we have a client connection in our handler, we want to quickly find the client information. So that's why we're using the map here. But the reason we want a array is so that we can randomly pick a client. You won't be doing this in your code because in your code, you're going to have some other business logic that's going to drive in which clients get updated and how they get updated. But it's just for our example. This allows me to get the list of clients, then do a modulus of a random number. So get some random number, do a modulus. So that wraps it within the length of my client list from zero to length minus one, essentially. That's how the modulus operator works. Now I have an index into my array. Now I can go into that array, get a client, which is the client remote string, and then use that to find the client. Now again, this is going to be called before we have any client connection. The length of client list is going to be zero. So we're going to be trying to do a divide by zero here. So I shouldn't do that. Instead, I should say Uh, let's do oh. okay so if our array is empty just return nil and remember we deal with nil here when we do get client so we have get client so that seems to be fine we have add client which was updated to add member store elements. So I think this should be fine now. Uh, let's review. Our main function is going to kick off a Go routine called update dashboard. Then register some handlers. Update dashboard in the background will try to get a client to update. So long when we don't have any connection, well, it's just spinning its wheel doing essentially nothing. Now, if we don't want this to go too fast, we can put a little sleep between this for a loop, but that is what it's doing. In our get client, we return a client from the dashboard, a random client, which we want to update. So if we have clients, then update dashboard is going to get a client from that list. Of course, we only have one client. It's going to always return the same client to update. Makes sense. If a client connects, we look in our database of clients, which is this map, try to get one. If it doesn't exist, we know we have to create a new one and add them. If they exist, then we update them and tell them what type of event we're returning and so on and we go get the events for that, try to get the events for that client. If the client doesn't have any events, we're going to wait a little bit. How long are we going to wait? We're going to give them up to one second to get some new events. And if we don't have any events, well, we have nothing to send. All right, so this should work. Let's take a look. Okay, and so we have a spectacular crash. So let's see what's the issue. Okay. Ah, assignment to entry in nil map. So we did not initialize our map before we tried to use it. Ah, makes sense. So we take care of that here. So once objects are added to our map, once we have a valid map, a non-nil map, then it's going to grow accordingly. So let's rerun. And there we go. Client connected, another client connected. And so we can see. Well, what you notice here is that we had a call and there wasn't any message to send. So if you see the client ID, because we log in each client when they're connected, but if you don't see any messages after the client ID, it means that all no messages were there. And this looks a little bit slow, but it's up to you to determine how long you want to wait and so on. So let's go back to our code and to our UI and see if it's working. Now, because we're doing random data, well, you can't really tell that these clients are getting separate events. It's working and you can go review the code and you can see that uh, we are using the client when it's connected to get the 
client object and from the client object we're keeping track of those events which we have the dashboard pushing into each client like i said you can have your clients do something different if you really want to demonstrate this you can have them have separate counts for example um, and one is incremented by one the other is incremented by 10 so you can show it how you are indeed tracking them differently so that's another way to prove that it's working. But again, just one way of doing it. I encourage you to think of other ways. And if you find some other interesting way or you find a bug, please send it to me. Now, you might be tempted to think that only on the first connection, you need to send back the event type. Like, so you might be thinking like, let's do this. If I'm in this for loop, it means that this client is a new client and I just need to tell them the one time that, hey, I'm tenant text event stream and they're gonna reconnect, true. You're going to see one connection and then you see one another connection because you told them text event stream and so they're going to reconnect after that first whatever second or milliseconds but guess what because on that second connection you send data but you didn't say the type is event stream the client wouldn't reconnect again at third time so definitely play with that and verify that that's how it works and it's consistent with the documentation for how event stream work if you remember oh, i don't need that don't need that okay so just something i, I thought i should point out to you so Good luck. Again, this code is going to be on GitHub, so feel free to check it out. And thank you for taking the time to watch the videos, subscribe, and for asking follow-up questions. I really appreciate that. It's helpful for me to be pressed to validate and verify things, so um, I don't mind that at all. So I hope this works for you if you're trying to build applications. Take care, and have a good rest of the day. Bye.